sermon today is what in the world is going on? And um, so what's, I'm going to ask you a question, and everybody should know this. What is tomorrow? It's Independence Day, right? It's the day that we declared independence from England for their tyranny and their taxing and everything else. But it wasn't the day that we got our freedom. It was the day we declared our freedom. After that was years worth of battles until we earned our freedom and won our freedom. And in case you didn't know and didn't realize it, and you should, we're in a battle and we're in a war today. And the warfare is even higher and more violent in our lifetime than it's ever been. And it's the war between light and darkness. And it's a war against the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Mm -hmm. And it's a battle for, for truth. I mean, you can proclaim the truth and you'll be fought tooth and toenail. It's a battle for righteousness by people thinking that wrong is right and up and down and evil is good and all you have to do, you can't, can't escape it. And it is a, a battle mostly between light and darkness. And it's real. And whether you know it or not, you're caught in the middle of it. And you have to choose a side to be on. Genesis 1 1 to 1 4 says this In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep water. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Then God said, let there be light, so there was light, and God saw that the light was good, so God separated the light from the darkness. In the beginning, God separated light and darkness. He changed darkness by the spoken word, let there be light. And I'm telling you today, the Spirit of God's hovering, still hovering over the darkness of this world, and he's waiting for us to speak the word of God into the situation, to change darkness into light. And that's what we're called to do. God has given us an anointing and, uh, to, to do it. And God has given us uh, the same anointing that Jesus has. And we have the same Holy Ghost. And we have the same words that Jesus spoke. And those words carry the same power as the day that when he spoke of. There is power in the word of God. And there is power in the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow beings in heaven and beings in earth and beings under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's not going to happen. It's happening. Amen. Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus said this. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to tell the good news to the poor. He sent me to announce forgiveness to the prisoners of sin and restoring of sight to the blind to forgive those who've been shattered by sin and to announce the Lord, year of the Lord's favor. That was Jesus' first sermon that he ever preached. That was a powerful one. The Spirit of God is on me to do all these things. And that was his mission and that was his ministry for the whole three and a half years that he walked on this earth. And he told us that is our mission and ministry too. To bring the gospel, the good news to people that are in darkness. To preach deliverance to the captive. Recovering of sight to the blind. Tell people there's better, there's a jubilee out there for them. Bring the first scripture up, Grant. This is uh, Paul, right, no, Luke actually wrote this. He said, you know that God has anointed Jesus from Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And with power, Jesus went everywhere and did good things, such as healing everyone who was under the devil's power. Jesus did these things because God was with him. And verse 39 says this, and we can testify to everything that Jesus did. So uh, uh, questions I would ask about this. Are we anointed by the Holy Ghost? Yes. Same Holy Ghost Jesus had, right? Yeah. There's not a different one. There's not a Holy Ghost one and two, right? So, right, good. Class participation today. Don't look at me like blank look. Can we go everywhere and do good things? Yes. yes. Sure. Everywhere. 
Everywhere we go, we can do good things, right? Is God with us? Yes, he, is. he is. He's in us, actually. And can we testify of these things? Absolutely. For every time we testify, we walk in the power of God and move in the Holy Ghost to dispel darkness and bring light. Every time. Every time you're in a position where you can testify of God's goodness, of God's mercy, what God has done for you, that is the power of God and the Holy Ghost working through you to dispel darkness, to set captives free, recovering the sight to blind, preach liberty to them that are uh, captives and, and to set people free. And every time you testify, the power of God is resident to do those things. And we're living in a time, and it's predicted all over the Bible, where we're getting close to the return of Jesus. I, I believe we're close. And we, by knowing that, we can see there's a great shaking going forth in the earth. It's a great, great shaking. Right now, as I speak, we're seeing Matthew 24, Luke 21 happening in front of our eyes on a daily basis. The world is being shaken. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. The country is being shaken right now. You'd have to live in a hole someplace not to know that. And the church is being shaken too. And there's a great ha shaking happening to us. And all through the New Testament, Jesus compares us to trees. So this is what happens when trees get shaken. First, dead limbs fall off. Dead limbs. What did he, uh, the Lord say about the last days? There was going to be a, a great what? Falling, falling away. away. Falling away. That is a falling away of believers from the church, mm -hmm. he said. And every church I've, and every pastor I speak to is experiencing the same thing. But I tell you, while people fall away, there's a harvest coming to when things are shaking, dead limbs fall off. And I know firsthand, I live in the woods. I have to pick up limbs on a weekly basis, and I make a huge fire out of them that goes up to the heavens. You know what I mean? I load it with gasoline and makes a sonic boom, but I have to pick them up all the time. The next thing that happens is fruit that's overly ripe and falls to the ground and rots there. Who's been to Carter Mountain or any orchard and seen that, right? You go out there, you pick the fruit that you want off the tree, but while you're picking the fruit, what's, when you look down, what is it? It's just full of rotten fruit that was good at one time, but no one picked it, and a wind came and shook it, a great shaking, and it hit the ground. Nobody picked it up. They don't want to waste their fruit. They want to make money off the fruit. It's not like the owner of the vineyard wants it to rot fall on the ground. It just does. I mean, this might seem like it's in the natural, but I have a spiritual meaning to this. The next thing that happens is the um, tree is strengthened because it withstood the storm. The dead branches fell off. The bad fruit fell off. And the branches were pruned. And they got stronger and they bear more fruit. And that's what the Lord wants for us. I want you to see how Jesus describes this process today. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15. John 15. This is a process. Let me know when you're there. John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. He also trims every branch that produces fruit to prepare it to produce even more. You have already been prepared to produce more fruit by the teaching I have given you. Stay joined to me, and I will stay joined to you. No branch can produce fruit alone. It must stay connected to the vine. It's the same with you. You cannot produce fruit alone. You must stay joined to me. I am the vine. 
You are the branches. If you stay joined to me and I to you, you will produce plenty of fruit. But separated from me, you won't be able to do anything. If you don't stay joined to me, you'll be like a branch that has been thrown out and has dried up. All the dead branches like that are gathered up, thrown into a fire, and burned. Staying joined together with me and follow my teachings, if you do this, you can ask for anything you want and it will be given to you. Show that you are my followers by producing much fruit. This will bring honor to my Father. So we're supposed to, as Christians, we're supposed to and be connected to Jesus. We're supposed to be bring honor to the Father by bringing forth fruit. Absolutely. My question to you today, and I know this is challenging so far. Are you bearing fruit? Absolutely. Are you bearing fruit? And if not, why not? And let me show you what's happening. And I, I think it started happening when my kids were, uh, were little. At least that's when I started noticing it. And the world was becoming, even back then, was becoming woke. Um, I don't know how to put it any further. When I, I remember when, when I was a kid, you didn't see, there wasn't any cussing on TV, right? Nobody ever said, I, was, I remember the first time I heard the word hell on TV, I was taken back from it. And then there was no agenda on TV driven. There was no, you never saw a homosexual. And if you did, they were always the butt of a joke. They were like, you know, they were sissies or something like that. They were made fun of. And then the 90s came when my kids were little and they started introducing them to television shows. And then it got to the point where if you look on TV now, every TV, every movie, every everything has homosexual, lesbian, transgender, and it's just looked at as normal. And it has crept its way into, uh, this is not in my notes, it has crept its way into churches so that churches, pastors will marry a homosexual couple um, even though the Bible says it's wrong. And they will celebrate that kind of thing as is, if it's normal and it's not. God created male and female. He didn't create transgenderism. We didn't see any of that 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it was there, but you didn't see it. And now they are brainwashing children to be that. And it's, and uh, what happened was, the world was becoming woke and the church didn't do anything about it. The church didn't really say anything about it. We separated from it. You know, we allowed Jesus to be taken out of schools. We allowed Jesus to be taken out of government and courthouses. And every place he was taken out of, darkness went in. Every place that Jesus went out of darkness, entered in and took over. And we didn't like it, but we didn't do anything about it except hide from it. And I'm telling you, it didn't work that way. Homeschooling our kids kept them from the immediate influence. We homeschooled to help our kids, and a lot of you homeschooled too. And you did that because you wanted to get them away from the influence. And that's the only thing that we thought that we could do, get them away from the influence. How about if we would have been aggressive and stopped the influence from happening? How about if we would have prepared our kids to be a light in that darkness, yeah. wouldn't that have been a better thing? Yes, sir. Instead of uh, protecting them until they're 18, then loosing them, letting them go. And you'll notice who's missing from churches is 18 to 30 year olds. Yep. That whole generation, that, and a lot of them were church kids, that we protected, that we got out of the influence of it, and we tried to think that maybe one hour or two hours of church a week was going to keep them from all the 160 some hours worth of the world that they were getting and it didn't work and we didn't do anything about it. We didn't say anything. We might have said something to each other. Oh, look how bad it's been. Look what the world's coming to. 
but we didn't do anything and we didn't prepare our children. And our influence didn't get out there and make a difference. And it should have. And our prayers, we never put feet to them. If we would have, it would have changed things. We never spoke into the darkness. We never spoke into the darkness in schools or organizations or businesses and hit them where it hurts in their pocketbook. We didn't do it. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. A lot of people don't like it. I don't care. I listened to my own sermon last week to make sure I wasn't too hard. But the truth needs to be told. Target still allows transgenders to use whatever bathroom they want to. Now, when people got upset, when they started doing that, people got upset, and they put a men's room or woman's room in a family restroom, and they just thought that, the, you know, that that would take everybody's eye off the fact that a man is going into a woman's room anytime they want him. You can't stop him, and that is their business practice. And you, no matter what you do, you can't stop him. Some people said, oh, maybe we should stop going there, but that didn't last long. Don't shout me down. And the, the truth is, businesses that do stuff like that, you should not support whatsoever. If you hit them where it hurts in their pocketbook, if you don't say anything, they think, well, it's just going to go away, or you'll get used to it. But you won't get used to it if it's your granddaughter or your daughter going in there and some man that dresses up like a woman goes in there and molests them because that kind of stuff happens every day. Yep. Starbucks. Now I'm getting, I'm getting down and dirty now. One of the biggest supporters of Planned Parenthood there is is Starbucks with their bitter, nasty $5 a cup coffee. And you know who's the biggest supporter of Starbucks? Christians. And you know who they who they support with their money? Who is the biggest, one of the biggest supporters of Planned Parenthood is Starbucks. So every time that you go in and support a business that gives a portion of what you pay for your coffee, they give it to Planned Parenthood. So you're paying for people to have abortions when you support a, an institution like that. You might say to yourself, well, I don't agree with that. If you don't agree with it, stop drinking that garbage. It's garbage anyway. It's quiet in this church. And bring the next scripture up, please. Acts 26, 18 says this. You will make them able to understand the truth. They will turn away from darkness to light. They will turn away from the power of Satan, and they will turn to God. Then their sins will be forgiven, and they will be given a place among God's people. That's our influence. That is our influence when we use the tools God gave us to rule and reign on earth. Prayer changes things, and we put Holy Ghost prayer, um, Holy Ghost uh, feet to our prayer, and actually speak into darkness and people and in organizations it accomplishes a lot. Buzz Lightyear movie that's out right now. Anybody has heard of the? Yeah. It's from Toy Story, right? He yeah. was one of the guys. I did some research. It took them $200 million to make this movie. And they spent millions marketing this movie. And they project that it's going to make $70 million. So they're going to lose $150 million on making this. This was supposed to be a blockbuster. This was supposed to be a movie every kid would see. You know why they're losing? Because one male to male kiss in this movie and the majority of parents don't want that influence on their little kids. Cartoon characters, boys are kissing. 
in this movie. And somebody said something, and it got out, and the news spread, and parents are like, nope, they ain't going to watch this one. We're not going to support it. And I say good for them. You know what? And that talks. Maybe the direction that they've been going, maybe though when it starts hitting them in the pocketbook, they'll change. I'm talking real life. I can live without supporting anything evil. It doesn't bother me never to have a Starbucks or never go to a Target or never to watch a certain kind of movie. It doesn't bother me. Come on now. I can live like that. And we can always give our business to Christian businesses or people that support the gospel. They need it right now. I don't care if I have to pay a little bit more for an item if it's going back into the kingdom of God. You give Christian business something and they're really a Christian business, they're going to tie it right back into the kingdom of God. They're not going to give it to Planned Parenthood. They're not going to let transgender people use their restrooms. They're not going to do stuff like that. And we, there are Christian businesses around, owned by Christian people. Find them. Truth. Go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, please. I'm not a political preacher. I'm just, this is what in the world is going on. And I'm filling you in as if you don't know, okay? Luke 17, 26. It says, when the Son of Man comes again, this is Jesus talking, mm -hmm. it will be the same as it was when Noah lived. People were eating, drinking, and getting married on the day when Noah entered the boat. Then the flood came and killed them all. It'll be the same as during the time of Lot, when God destroyed Sodom. Those people were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building houses for themselves. They were doing these things even on the day when Lot left town. Then fire and sulfur rained down from the sky and killed them all. That's exactly how it will be when the Son of Man comes again. <coughs> Now, Jesus was referring back to a time that was 3,000 years before he walked the earth and said it's just going to be just like that when he comes back. And what we know about those days, we can say about the days we live in too. Hebrews 11, 7 says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house, in which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is of faith. You know, it took Noah about 120 years to build the ark. And I'm sure in that 120 years as he's building, he was mocked for his beliefs. I'm sure some thought he was crazy um, because up to that point it had never rained on the earth before, but water came up to the ground. And the one thing I want you to notice is this, that Noah prepared for what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. He prepared his house. Jesus also used the word prepared two times when he spoke of it. How are you preparing for the time we're living in? I'm saying that. If you're preparing food for a shortage, that's a smart thing. They are predicting one, the biggest shortage in your lifetime in October, November time frame. They're, they're saying, in case you don't know, there's been another huge chicken farm burned down last week and it's been over in the last year and a half it's been over a hundred and it's been about 20 more processing plants and it has been farmers are not planting as much and we don't go by what they plant this year because this year's harvest is for next year's planting we go by what happened last year when COVID was in mid, mid thing and they couldn't get the supplies and they didn't plant as much where they planted even less this year and one of the biggest suppliers of grain and wheats in the world is Ukraine. And they don't have anything in their fields. And farmers couldn't get fertilizer this year. And I know the Amish, they just use manure in their fields, and it works for them. But people that didn't, or never didn't plant as much. So this, and the biggest farm owner in the United States 
is Bill Gates. And he's not playing anything. He's trying to make you all eat fake meat and fake food. Like Soylent Green. Everybody remember that movie? So, Soylent Green is people. So, so um, listen. This is man-made. How are you preparing for it? How are you preparing for it? it you know what's going to happen? It's going to affect the world big time because they're not preparing for it. And they get greedy and they're going to run out and buy everything they can. And if you don't move before they move, they're going to get what you should have. And we don't do it just to heap up for ourselves. That's right. There's a reason why God is preparing the church to have the things that the world will not have. Amen. And that is to bring them to a place where they see their need for Jesus. And the Christians, who do you think feeds the world? It's Christian organizations. We are we give to Christian organizations that feed people. All our missionaries feed people. Yes, we, we give to people. That, that is the biggest thing. And how big do you think it's going to happen? And all these other organizations out there that say they give, uh, they feed the hungry and all that kind of stuff like that. Well, their CEOs make billion, you know, millions of dollars and that somebody might get 10 cents out of every dollar. They might. March of Dimes, that's how much they give to people, a dime out of every dollar. And the, and the people in their organization have gotten rich out of it. Goodwill, there's no goodwill. As a matter of fact, they get everything for free and they sell it for money and they don't give it back to anybody. The people that do are Salvation Army. They it's do. There. Yes. They are givers. But there are a million organizations like that. But if you Perfect. look around, who has fed Africa and starving India and starving people for the last 50 years? It has been the church. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why we are to prepare now. So we have to give. Bible says, let him steal, steal, steal no more, but let him work that he might have to give to those that have need. Amen. That's a big issue. But the bigger issue is how are you preparing yourself and your family? Think about it. What did Noah do that Lot didn't do? Noah left in the boat with his whole family. Yep. Lot left with his two daughters. Yep. His wife turned around to look, and she turned to a pillar of salt. salt. The rest of his family, and the Bible says that he had family in Sodom, and he went to tell them, and they didn't believe him because of his lifestyle. He wasn't prepared. His righteous soul was vexed with the behavior of the wicked, the Bible says in 2 Peter. He didn't have any influence over his own family. And because he didn't, he couldn't talk them into going out of town. They laughed at him. They thought he was joking. His wife turned around, turned into a pillar of salt. How vexed and how um, the lot was, was when the angels came to his house to rescue him and get him out. And the men of the city wanted to have relations with them. You know, they said, bring those men out so we can know them, so we can have relations with them. Lot said no, and he was willing to give them his two virgin daughters. How corrupted was his mind? Noah got his family, was prepared, his ark to the saving of his family. Lot barely got out of his life. And his family, he lost them. One thing we know by the scripture in their testimony that Jesus talked about right before judgment came things that seemed normal. The Bible says in those days they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were building houses and selling houses yep. until the day when Sodom came, when fire came down or to the day when the ark, uh, God shut the door. Yep. So one of the things that I want you to have peace about as a Christian that during this shortage they were eating they were eating 
They were drinking. They, they, were, they had supplies. It doesn't say they were starving. God's got us preparing for what? Nine, ten months now? And I hope you have prepared. Because this is what's going to happen. It's not going to happen. Revelation 6.6 6 says, I heard what sounded like a voice from somewhere among the four living creatures. It said, a quart of wheat will cost you a whole day's wages. Three quarts of barley will cost you a day's wages too. That's how bad it's going to get the moment we're not here anymore. The That's moment right. we're in the ark and God closes the door. The moment we're out of Sodom and Gomorrah where it rained fire and brimstone. The moment we're going, there's going to be such a famine to hit the earth that you'll have to work a whole day in order to make a loaf of bread for your family. A whole day. That means you have a choice whether you're going to feed your family, you're going to pay your mortgage, you're going to pay your rent, your car payment. That means if you don't make those things, they're going to take those things away from you. The only way to be safe is to be on the ark with your family. Amen. Are you being prepared? So here's the question. Are your words of warning that you speak to your family having any weight on them? Do they hear you when you speak to them? And if not, why? Do they? The, your words, when you speak these words to your family about the coming judgment, about the ark of safety, about what's coming on the earth, does it hold any weight? What do they, do they shrug you off and just think you're nuts like Noah? There's a reason why, if your words have no weight to them, if they don't take you seriously, the reason, there's a reason why. Amen. The second thing about Noah, Grant, bring up, please. No, uh, well, again, the scripture again, you will be able to make them understand the truth. Yeah. They will turn the darkness to light. We have already seen the scripture one time. They will turn away from the power of Satan. They will turn to God. This is what happens if you got a strong witness. If they witness the way you live, if they witness God being good to you, if they witness that God's taking care of you, even in the hardest of times, Amen. they will see it. Because they might not believe your words, but they'll see That's right. you're different. And they'll you will make them understand the truth. That means you've got to say something. Yeah. A, a lot of us aren't saying anything to people. <clears throat> Next one, Grant, please. Next thing Noah did, Noah heard God and did what he said to the exact specifications. Yeah. Noah was able to hear from the Lord clearly. That is more important in the time we live in than any other thing. Be able to hear God's voice for yeah. yourself. Yeah. What if Noah would have taken some shortcuts in God's specifications? This is the picture of the ark in Kentucky, which I want to go see so bad. So, um, and it's built to the exact specifications as what the Bible says the ark was. And if you notice in the picture on the left-hand side right there, that is a huge SUV and three people standing next to it that looked like a dot. That's how big the ark was. But he, the Bible says he was moved by fear and, and built the ark and he was able to hear. And God didn't bring the rain until he was finished bringing, uh, building it. It took 120 years. Yeah. But the day he entered into the ark. God shut the door. And everybody that thought he was a nut, that day he looked like a genius. Everybody who didn't believe, that day he believed. Do you know after we're going, there's, the world will know. A lot of them will be deceived, but the, your, the ones that know you and know your Christmas, 
Christian witness, they'll know for sure the things that you told them were true. And it's not like they can't be saved during that time. You know, Jesus is in heaven, you're in heaven with him, the Father's in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is still on the earth because people will be getting saved. But in order to receive Jesus and not receive the mark, you'll have to give up your life. And if you don't think the mark is coming and the mark is close, you're not paying attention. <laughs> you're not paying attention. People might not take it because they say, well, that's the mark. That might be the mark of the beast, but if you're hungry and you have to have that to get food, because the Bible says you can't buy or sell without it. How about that? And if you have it, you just got damnation. There's no salvation for you. Mm. And so Noah didn't see judgment. Bring that scripture, Grant. Thessalonians says this, it says, But let us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That means we're not going to see this kind of judgment. Just like God shut the door on Noah and his family and an ark of safety, we will be gone before anything bad happens. We don't have to live through tribulation times, but we have to be smart while we're here. The next thing, Noah did so to the saving of his house. It was whole house salvation. And there are promises in the word of God for, for whole house salvation. It doesn't matter where they are right now, how woke they are right now, yeah. how far away from God they are right now, you have a promise in the word of God Amen. that you shall be saved in your house. Yes. Whole house. Whole house. Acts 16, 31, 32 says this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. But listen to this. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that was in the house. Are you getting what I'm trying to say now? It's not going to happen without you speaking to them the word of the Lord. Yeah. And right after Paul said this, the man he said it to, his whole house got saved, his whole house got baptized, his whole house got filled with the Spirit of God, and he had quite a few. And he had friends and neighbors that came at the same time. And the reason why is because they gave them the word of God and they believed it. Mm -hmm. See, how will they hear without a preacher? How will they know what's going to happen without you warning? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what opened the door to this? It was a great shaking. Paul and Silas were arrested, thrown into the inner prison, and beaten, and their feet were in stocks. And they were beaten. And then at the darkest time, and I've said this last week because it seems like there's a lot of pressure out there in the world right now and in people's lives. And there is. It's a real thing that's happening. It's a shaking. But right at the biggest amount of pressure, breakthrough is right around the corner. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. I want you to sing journey songs for you. Right <laughs> Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying for them. Don't stop witnessing to them. Right when it seems like the biggest amount of pressure and they're going in the opposite direction and they don't want to hear what you have to say, breakthrough happens and the only one that can get the glory is God. Only one who can get the glory is God. You can't say, well, I did this and I did that, you know, yeah. because they're, they're running hot fast in the opposite direction. But yeah. guess what? God's got a chain that they can only go so far in. His look, he's going to jerk them right back. Yes. You watch. You watch. Amen. I will. So they were in, their feet was in stocks. They were beaten. It was the darkest time in their life. They were bloody. They were beaten. And the Bible says at midnight, at the darkest time, 
They prayed and sang praises, and all the prisoners, everybody else that was in the jail heard them. And all at once there was a great shaking. You know, the devil's trying to shake everything right now, but when God starts shaking things, things happen. Yes. And every chain fell off every prisoner, and every prison door was opened. Because at midnight they prayed and sang praises to God. And a jailer was going to kill himself. But Paul said, we're all here. Don't do it. Don't. And then his whole house got saved. Hallelujah. The worst of times opened the door to the best of times. Mm. And you know what? For vindication, and I love this part. He went to the guy's house. The whole house got saved. The whole house got baptized. They took Paul and Silas and they washed their backs and they, you know, uh, cleaned up all their wounds and everything. And then they said, you know, go ahead and go. And they said, no, we ain't going. They made the people that put them in jail come back and beg them to leave. That's vindication. Yeah, buddy. You arrested me falsely. Guess what? I'm a Roman. Uh-oh. And you beat me uncondemned. Uh-oh. They had to beg him, beg him to leave. And he made him too. He made him beg. So, there's a scripture in Nehemiah that says this. And besides that, it was, a, it was such a miracle that we just talked about. But Nehemiah says, fight for your brothers and your sons and daughters and your wives and fitting houses. It's time to fight for them. There's time to fight. There's a time we're in a battle. There's time to fight for them. Fight for their souls. Genesis 6, 5 says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination and thought of his heart was only equal, evil continually. Kind of what we're seeing right now. One thing after the other. One act of violence one act of hate after another, one step into depravity even deeper than the last. How about when you invite a drag queen to come into a library and read lewd children's books to your children, little children, at your school? It's happening. When you give puberty blockers to children and tell boys they're girls and girls they're boys, and you are whatever you feel like this day without letting their parents know. And I've told you this before, when we were at, a few years back, when we were at the Finger Lakes on vacation, we went to a, a lake um, and we saw a young girl, I guess she was in her young 20s, and she had three kids and she was walking up and she had two girls and a boy, and the boy was the baby, he was three, maybe three and a half, four, and it was six, like five and four or something like that, and the two girls were wearing pretty dresses, and they were pretty little girls. And the boy came up, and he, and he was wearing a dress, too. And I said, oh, you have a nice family. Two, two girls and a boy, huh? She said, no, three girls. You could look and see that was clearly a boy. It wasn't a girl. She was making him into a her. And I know I'm supposed to walk in the love of God. But I could have punched her right out for ruining that young child's life like that. Making boy become a girl. It was it was wokeness. Forgive me, Lord, I wouldn't have done it, but I, I just, it riled me up so that I still, it still riles me up to this day that, that doing that to children. Greg, play video two one time. that I would have to face the prospect of not living in the United States of America, at least not the one I've known all my life. I've never wished to live anywhere else. This is my home, and I was privileged to be born here. But today I woke up, and as I had my morning coffee, I realized that everything is about to change. No matter how I vote, no matter what, I say something evil has invaded our nation, and our lives are never going to be the same. I've been confused by the hostility of family and friends. I look at people I've known all my life, so hate-filled that they agree with opinions they would never express as their own. I think I may have well entered the twilight zone. We've become a nation that has lost its collective mind. You can't justify this insanity. If a guy pretends to be a woman, you're required to pretend with him. 
Somehow, it's un-American for the census to count how many Americans are in America. Russians influencing our elections are bad, but illegals voting in our elections are good. It was cool for Joe Biden to blackmail the president of Ukraine, but it's an impeachable offense if Donald Trump inquires about it. 20 is too young to drink a beer, but 18 is old enough to vote. People who have never owned slaves should pay slavery reparations to people who have never been slaves. People who have never been to college should pay the debts of college students who took out huge loans for their degrees. Immigrants with tuberculosis and polio are welcome, but you better be able to prove your dog is vaccinated. Irish doctors and German engineers who want to immigrate to the U.S. must go through a rigorous vetting process, but any illiterate gangbangers who jump the southern fence are welcome. $5 billion for border security is too expensive, but $1.5 trillion for free health care is not. If you cheat to get into college, you go to prison, but if you cheat to get into the country, you go to college for free. People who say there's no such thing as gender are demanding a female president. We see other countries going socialist and collapsing, but it seems like a great plan to us. Some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born, and other people are not held responsible for what they're doing right now. Criminals are caught and released to hurt more people, but stopping them is bad because it's a violation of their rights. And pointing out all this hypocrisy somehow makes us racist. Nothing makes sense anymore. No values, no morals, and no civility. People are dying of a Chinese virus, but it's racist to refer to it as Chinese even though it began in China. We're clearly living in an upside down world where right is wrong and wrong is right, where moral is immoral and immoral is moral, where good is evil and evil is good, where killing murderers is wrong but killing unborn babies is a-okay. Wake up America, the great unsinkable ship, Titanic America, has hit an iceberg is taking on water and is sinking fast. Speak up. Amen. That guy staring at us weird there. I speak up. Get the lights, please. I speak up too much. <laughs> and I get punished for it. But this is what I want you to know. Can I bring my server slides up? You don't win battles without a strategy. If you've not been able to witness and get people to listen to you and family and friends, and you're not going to do it without a plan. Luke 14, 31 says, have you ever heard of a commander who goes out to war without first sitting down with strategic planning, determine the strength of his army to be able to win the war? So this is what happens. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to reach people without a plan. I mean, we can't depend on divine appointments all the time and missed opportunities all the time. Mm -hmm. We need a plan. You want to reach your family. You need to maybe have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Let them hear your heart. Let them know that your conversation is not coming out of condemnation, but it's coming out of love. I love you. I don't want you to miss it. And guess what? I think you will. Well, you can't judge me. You don't know my heart. Well, I know that you, you're not serving God with your life. I can see that. You're not obeying the word of God. Do you really think because you said a simple little prayer when you were scared or when you were little that it's going to hold any weight for you today that you can go to heaven without living for the Lord? Come on. Jesus said this, what you say to me, Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I say. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we not did that? Didn't we pray to you? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? He's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. I didn't have a relationship with you. So you need a strategic plan in order to reach these people. Take them out to lunch. Have them over to dinner. Just have carve out some time for them, especially if it's your family and you love. Talk to them privately, not in front of their husbands or wives or, or girlfriends or anything. Just talk to them and say, I love you. I can look at your life. And you. I do see God in your life some. I mean, you... Because when you're raised that way, or if you're raised to know the truth, 
It's going to be in you, right? And you have a promise from the Lord. If you know it, you teach it to them when they're young. When they're older, they won't depart from it. And that might kind of, like I said, God's got, a, God's got a, their strength. He's going to pull them back. Amen. But there's something that you need to be able to do. Mm -hmm. You need to. There's people in your heart. I hope everybody in here has an assignment from God. I hope everybody has a prayer assignment from God for salvation. And we say we love our friends so much that we work with and they're friends and comrades at work and stuff like that. And I say this again, and I don't say it to your shame, but I say it to, as a wake-up call. How often have you talked to them about the Lord? Their salvation. If you really love them, are you going to love them into heaven? Do you have a plan? Or are you going to go ahead and let them go to hell on your watch? We only have two options. One is to do nothing, and that's what most Christians do, nothing. And the other one is to push back and tell them about Jesus. Jesus said in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. You know, we were born for such a time as this. We're not here in this time by mistake. We're here by the hand of providence. God had us born in this time, and he's thinks that there's more that we can do than we even think that we can do. Grant, bring up the next scripture. It says, little children, you can be certain that you belong to God and have conquered them for the one who is living in you is far greater than the one that's in the world. They belong to the world and they articulate the spirit of this world and the world listens to them, but we belong to God and whoever truly knows God listens to us. Those who refuse to listen to us do not belong to God. Those, that is how we can know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. If they're willing to listen to you, if they're willing to hear you, then they belong to God and you can talk them coming right back into the kingdom of things. If they're not willing to hear you, and they're not willing to listen, they don't belong to God. That's not the words of Pastor Don. That's the words of the Lord. I think he knows, don't you? And that's how, that's a strategic way to pray for them, too. Number two, Grant. We have to reestablish the right foundation in our own homes. Amen. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And this is where I get from preaching to meddling. Have we allowed... The things we watch, the things we allow on our gates, the things we see with our eyes, the things we hear with our ears, and what comes out of our mouth to influence us, to stop us from having influence on other people's lives. You know, like I said, I was, before I came, before 19, March 14, 1986, when I came to the Lord, I, got, I was that person that God was pulling on. I was that person that was running from it. But I was had a form of godliness, but I didn't serve God with my life. But, and before that time, but I, I tell you what, he was pulling on me, but I was the biggest hypocrite. I, I wanted the Lord, but I wasn't willing to get things, certain things out of my life in order to have it. I was bound. Have you let things back into your life? God knows. It'll stop your influence. Joshua said this, and this is where I'm going to stop. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you serve, whether the gods of your father served, that were on the other side of the flood, where the God of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wrote myself a note, and for the life of me, I don't remember what it meant. Huh. So, now you can stop that. Um, <laughs> All right. I'm trying to get us in.